Hi, welcome to Full Throttle RC, presented by Warehouse Hobbies. I'm your host, Tony Castronovo. And in today's episode, we're going to talk about tune pipes. We're going to learn how they work. We're going to learn why they work. We're going to learn how to measure them. We're going to teach you everything you need to know about a tune pipe for your gasoline model boat. So stay tuned and come right back. Hey guys, we got a new product from you by Enforcer Manufacturing, the new magnetic precision prop balancer. Something we designed about two months ago to get the price down and have a precision balancer on the market, and I think we did it. This balancer features two extremely high powerful magnets that can support a single axis of the shaft. By doing this, we can achieve balance at the hub, and we can see where the prop is out of balance at both sides. This is an aluminum prop, and let me show you how great this is, that weighs two ounces, an injection molded prop. And the unit is so precision that it can find the heavy side on an aluminum lightweight prop. As easy as that. Okay? To make changes, sand on the prop or work the prop, just remove one of the balance, one of the, the, the cones, pull the prop off, and you can make your changes. You can take some material off, and it's very easy. Put it back on, like so. You put the self-centering cone back in place, and that presses against the propeller. Each cone this is a unique, unique feature here. Each cone has an adjustable thumb screw that compresses the cone on the shaft. And this stiffens it up to apply greater pressure to the propeller. So if you need more pressure, you simply tighten the thumb screws, less loosen it. This is the new Precision Enforcer Prop Balancer. Available at Warehouse Hobbies. It'll be on sale probably in the beginning to middle of October 2008 at a suggested selling price of $29.95. So make sure you give us a call at 1-800-444-1995 and get yours on order today. The Enforcer Prop Balancer. Okay, let's get to the theory of this. Okay, very basic theory. A lot can be learned about tune pipes on the internet and I... I strongly recommend for you guys that really want to go in depth on this to basically just Google tune pipes and you'll find an array of intelligence and, and explanations of how they work. Two basic things are taking place because you're probably asking, what do we care? Why we tune in an engine? What does that have to do with anything? And it's really important on a two cycle engine, okay? This applies. Remember, there's no valves in our engine. And if you go back and, look and watch one of my shows on theory that explains the piston port timing where I described that there was a point in time that we have what they call an overlap. And this is where the piston is down and the fuel is coming up. And there's a point in time, a fraction of a second, to where fuel, gasoline coming into the engine, can literally escape a little bit out the exhaust. Okay? And if we lose anything out the exhaust before it goes into compression, obviously we're losing performance. Here's where the tune pipe comes in. By controlling the length of the tune pipe and the header, let's look at this model here, length and header, sort of like a trombone. Okay? We can control the speed, the timing of the wave, the pulse that the engine is pro producing. So, if you look here and you, you saw the diagram of how I'm showing how the wave is going, as the wave is expanding out and then changing directions back, if we can control the time for a back pressure to develop at the exhaust cycle of the cylinder, precisely at the time that that window is open for, this, for that fraction, it'll put a fictitious push pressure against the cylinder, keeping that gasoline in during that split second of time. And when we achieve this, we have now tuned this exhaust. We are keeping that, we are keeping that gasoline from escaping by tiny the waves, the pulse waves back, holding pressure against the window. Another thing that takes place, if you, if you read about the theory of this, and this gets kind of complicated, it's a little over my head, but there's a scavenging effect that takes place as well. And it's, said, and it's said to believe that there's a, there's a reverse draw that is pulling some of the expended gases out so we're getting a cleaner and a, and a, and a better burn charge on the, on the next cycle. And that's basically the concept of a tuned exhaust. Now when I was learning how to do this, I didn't know all this theory and it was basically trial and error. So everything we did back then was cut, weld, move. We knew basically that if we extended the length of a pipe, we would gain power. If we shortened the pipe, we would gain RPMs. Now, either way you go, there's a, there's a loss at the other end. So, with that said, 
it's important that when you're setting up a pipe for the specific boat that you're running and the specific prop that you'll need to be running, that the pipe length makes a big difference. Because if you have a large boat, let's say something over 50 inches that's going to turn a large diameter prop, such as a 75 millimeter or larger, then remember I told you about RPMs and horsepower. As we pull the pipe out, we gain horsepower. As we push it in, we get RPMs. Now obviously the more RPMs we can get, the faster we go. But there comes a point to where we'll push that pipe in and not be able to make enough horsepower to turn that large prop. Now opposite on the other end, let's go into a racing boat, something lightweight, 13, 14 pounds, small prop, 70 millimeters in diameter. Technically, we don't need as much horsepower, obviously, to turn a 70 millimeter prop. So we can tweak that pipe in a little bit more, a little bit more, and get the maximum amount of RPMs allowable before we lose horsepower to turn that prop too. So that's how the tune pipe works. As you draw it out, you gain horsepower. As you draw it, but lose RPMs. As you push in, you gain RPMs, but lose horsepower. And when you're talking about tuning a pipe, guys, one inch, one way, another, will make all the difference in the world for being right or wrong. Okay, let's talk about wet pipes versus dry pipes. I'm going to start with a dry pipe because that's your basic standard tuned pipe. And that's the one I have in my hand here. And I'll show you what differentiates a dry from a wet. A dry pipe means that there is nothing but exhaust traveling through the header and into the pipe. Okay, the wet locations on this pipe are primarily for cooling purposes only, such as the manifold right here. Water does not enter the pipe, just circles around the manifold, keeps that cool. And also the pipe coupler here, where water can exit through the pipe, go around the coupled area to keep that cool with your O-rings inside, and then water expels out the boat. That, this is a dry pipe. Okay, dry pipes, when set up right, are unbelievable. You can get 15, 20% more power out of an engine with a properly tuned pipe. Okay? Let's talk about wet pipes. The wet pipe is something I basically fell into by accident. I remember back about 1986 that we ran into some situations where the dry pipes, they do run pretty hot, and we wanted to make the first enclosed gas boat, and that was called the Team Enforcer Pro. And we were working on a dry pipe system, and with what was available at the time, very little. I remember I was hodgepodge and making things and cutting things up and making it work. Well, when we did achieve this, we ran into a lot. Of, we ran into a situation where the temperatures inside the boat got extremely hot. So I had this idea. I was watching jet ski at the, at the time. Jet ski uh, Kawasaki was using wet systems, and I was, they were tuning their pipes with water in them. So I pretty much started learning about what they were doing and, and started experimenting with injecting water into the pipe. I felt if I could put water into the pipe, I can, you know, achieve the same thing they did. And they, had, they did this because obviously to put a pipe system with a 440cc engine in a small fiberglass boat, that pipe would run eight, 900 degrees and that would be a problem, such as we were facing with the model boats. So I messed around with a 15cc pipe and what we were doing was we were injecting, and I'll show you the model because it's basically the same concept of today, right here. Let's move this out of the way. We started injecting water into the header and putting it into the pipe and letting the water you know, it fell off the back of the pipe. It was tough in the beginning. It didn't work. We had lots of problems. We started working with different diameters, different amounts of water in there. And finally, over, over time and, and practice, one day we stumbled on being able to tune this pipe with water inside of it. Now, it did not tune as good as a dry pipe. Okay, and we weren't really sure the differences. We know when we're running a boat, we could see probably a four or five mile an hour difference in some cases between a good dry pipe and a wet pipe. However, when it came down in reality, the fact that we were able to conceal this pipe inside that hull and at a pipe that would run at 120, 30 degrees versus six, seven, eight hundred degrees, we knew we had a winner. And over time, we kept experimenting with different size openings, uh, different amount of water inlets into the pipe until we achieved a good running tuned pipe. Again, I never stated it was as good as dry, but we always felt that there was a difference of around, oh, I'd maybe. 15, 20 percent difference between wet and dry, but we were pretty happy with it because of the end results. A concealed pipe in a boat with a cover on it that still performed well. And that was called the wet tuned exhaust system that we designed and pioneered back in 1987. All right, before I get into the dry pipes, I want to continue a little bit about the wet pipe. The pro wet tuned system, what you see here, today's current version, very similar to what was done 20 years ago. 
we had actually engineered our own water fittings, specifically drilled out with the right sizes to let the right amount of water into the pipe to get optimum tuning with it. I wanted to know why, so I pretty much contacted a lot of engineers of the day, why it was working, and, and the theory was, it was, and it makes a lot of sense, is we were able to make a lot shorter pipe. If you look at the difference between the dry pipe system, for instance, and this pro wet system, if you were to stretch this out, there's a large, there's a large differential, six inches in overall length. Uh, length. Technically, we, I was pretty much puzzled. Why am I able to tune, get this engine to run up in a tuned state or on pipe with a wet system and the dry was so long? And one of the gentlemen from Kawasaki, one of the engineers, pretty much summed it up and, and told me this 20 years ago. He says, if you're injecting water into the header with the right amount, he says, you're cooling the exhaust gases down. He says, you're changing the expansion rate of the sound wave and therefore changing the length of the pipe. So you can tune up engine with water in the pipe. You know, again, not optimum as, as it would be with a dry pipe, but the benefits are, on, are excellent. You have a very, virtually a non-maintenance system that is pre-calibrated, installed into, a bo into the boat, ready to go. And that is called the pro-wet tune pipe. Here's an important tip that I want to show you about putting a tuned pipe on a header. And most of our tuned pipes today, including anything that you'll purchase through Wearhouse Hobbies, uh, for dry pipes that is, runs an O-ring system inside. And the O-rings we choose to use are mostly a silicone base, and so do most manufacturers. And you know, you can get into a little bit of problems if you try to lube them up with some WD-40 or petroleum base uh, greases. What happens is they'll affect the actual silicone base and create a problem. So, and also another thing with lubrications like that is they never dry. So if you were to use if you were to use a lubrication on the O-ring, all that's going to do is make it very easy for that pipe to move back and forth. Let me give you a little trick that works fantastic. Straight dish washing soap. I don't care what brand you use. Get a little bit of dish washing soap, put it in a little bottle, carry it with you in your in your case, in your toolbox. And take your dish washing soap, apply a drop on your fingers, put it around your O-rings, smear a little bit on the pipe and it makes it very easy for the pipe to move. Now, once you're set and you put your pipe in operation, that dishwashing detergent will it'll evaporate, it'll dry, and it gives a nice hard, hard bond. So it's unlike uh, petroleum-based greases where it'll be slippery and move around. Once the dishwashing soap dries, it makes it very difficult for the pipe to move. So that's a nice trick and something that you guys ought to try if you haven't done it before. Okay, let's get into measuring a pipe. This is something I must explain a half a dozen times a day on the telephone, and I wanted, I've been waiting to do this show so I could pretty much make it real simple on how you guys can measure a pipe properly. Okay, there's a couple different methods I've been hearing about, but I'm going to show you the old faithful way of doing it that, that works all the time. And like I said, all, even, even our exclusive design is pre-tuned for this particular engine and, and application. Okay, but let me show you. The easiest way to measure a pipe, okay, is having a piece of rope, and I have a piece of one-eighth inch rope here, all right, or string, and we need to measure the distance of the tunable area here. So, the best way to do it is start right here. Let me get my pointer. Chris, zoom in. Start at the flange of the engine exhaust port itself, okay? You want to be inclusive of the manifold. This is the exhaust manifold, this part right here. Okay, but we're going to start right before the manifold at the flange. I'm going to take the piece of string, I'm going to put it right at the back, and we're going to stay on center of the header, like this, and the pipe. Keep the string on center, and when you get to the point where the two cones come together, your convergence cone and divergence cone meet, make a mark. Okay? get my marker here so we can get a good mark here. Okay, so let's do that one more time to be sure. Okay, we're going to start at the flange of the exhaust, inclusive, inclusive of the header and manifold. We're going to follow on center, okay, like so, until we get to the wide point where the two cones meet, and then that's what we have here. Now, we will, it's very easy from here. We take our ruler, or tape measure, we go and we measure the string to that mark. Let's find the mark. 
Okay. And here we have about one foot. So the measurement from this point to here is around a foot. Okay, so if you were to call me and say, I have this particular boat, I'm running this particular prop, I'm running this particular pipe with this type of engine work done or no engine work done, I'll be able to give you a general starting area. I might say, okay, let's measure that pipe at 14 and a half inches to start. So, very simple. You would take a piece of rope, you'd pre-cut it at 14 and a half inches, follow the same procedure on center, and adjust that pipe in or outward until you've achieved the 14 inches where the two cones meet. Okay, I showed you how to measure a pipe with a zero band where the cones come together. And let me show you how to measure a pipe with a band in it. For instance, the two-inch band here. When you take your measurement from the flange of the exhaust on center, just like you would do a standard pipe, when you get to the center of uh, where the two cones would normally meet here, there, there's a, a span between them, and that's the band. So take the measurement to the center of the band, and that's a good, easy way to measure a band pipe. Okay, before we go, let's touch one more thing that I didn't talk about on, on measuring. We went over the, we went over the, the band pipe, the two-inch band pipe. We've been over the standard zero band pipe on measurements, and we went over the wet pipe system on measurements. There's a couple things that have been brought to my attention on measuring, and, and uh, it doesn't work for all applications, and it's very important to know this. I've had guys call and tell me, well, I, I ask them to measure their pipe, and, and they give me this measurement that doesn't make any sense. And then they tell me, well, we're measuring from the header, to the, the pipe, like, like so. We're taking from the center of the header and we're measuring to the pipe. And in this case, it's eight inches. Well, obviously, if I told you you needed 12 inches and you came back with eight inches, that would be completely wrong. This measurement only works if the application is identical to the next guy, to, to your buddies, to his boat. In other words, if that engine center of gravity is in this particular place, okay, the pipe measures out, technically it measures out 12 inches where it's supposed to be, Okay, then that would, this would apply, where you can do this. But the problem that messes this whole deal up is the differential in headers. If you measured this with an inch and a half radius, eight inches would be different than if you measured it with a two and a half or a three and a half inch radius, because we just picked up length in the header. And the header is part of the measurement equation to measure a pipe right. So please, one more time, when we do pipe measurements, especially when you call me, let's do it the simple way. Let's take the string. Let's take that measurement that I showed you from the exhaust window. And let's measure the string. And then we're on the same wavelength, and we know that we're going to get a properly measured pipe. Okay? Let's also purchase pipes designed for what we're going to be using them for. If you're not purchasing through me, talk to the manufacturer who sold you the engine or who sold you the pipe. We can't tell you exactly where your pipe is going to work the best, but we can tell you, we can give you a parameter which will be right in that 75 to 80 percent range, and I can do that. So guys out there that say they can't do that, that's not, that's really not the truth. They really don't have what it takes with, with their engines and tuned pipes, because the truth is, an engine builder and a person that's been doing this for, for a while and a guy knows pipes will be able to get you the basic starting point that you should be at. Okay, and uh, they should be able to, to tell you what size prop should run with your boat, about, okay, about where the pipe measurement should be within, you know, I can get you guys within a half inch, three quarters of an inch, and right and wrong, okay. So it's very important that you buy the right prop, the right pipe, and the right engine combination for your boat. It doesn't do you any good to have the wrong propeller, the wrong pipe, and, 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 and the wrong engine you'll fight yourself, okay? It's very important that you have a combination of these three or four, four including the hull, that work together. Okay, that is very important. Okay, let's talk about a couple of different types of drive pipes. We've talked about the standard pipe, which has been known to be called the zero band pipe. I've heard that term used many times, so that's a, that's a good name. Zero band, meaning the two cones come together. Your divergence cone, and convergence cone both meet and are welded or adhered in the center. Let's talk about a band pipe. And a band pipe is something we worked with, again, back in the late 80s when we started doing real big boats. 
and I'll explain what the differences are. If you're running a smaller boat with a smaller prop, where you where it's it's easier to get the engine up into its operating range, the two-stroke engine up into its operating range, okay? The zero band pipe is going to be more beneficial for speed, for top end, all right? And what this means is if you've got a light enough boat, small enough boat, small enough prop, and you don't require as much horsepower to get that prop spinning to get it up into the, the level to where the engine is at its, its peak operation or what we call tuned, then you can, this particular pipe will be better. When we ran into the larger boats, when I started experimenting with larger boats, 55, 57, 60 inches, we would run into problems with the zero band pipe years ago where we'd want to get our exhaust timings as high as possible to get the most performance, but we would get into a situation where we increased the wheel or the prop size larger that the engine couldn't make enough power to spin the prop fast enough to get it up on, get it up on pipe. And this is evident. If you ever watched model boat racing, you ever guys ever watch outriggers, and the guys take the outriggers and they whip them in the water. They get them, they just throw them so they step up on plane. And this is so we can run a shorter pipe and optimize in high RPMs, but by throwing the boat in the water, we're going to relieve that prop. We're going to get that boat going fast and the engine will they can easily get up into its operating range. Well, when you're dealing with a deep V or a catamaran, something where you want to go slow and you go to nail it, if you can't make that transition from the low end to high, you pretty much just load the engine down. The engine would just whoa and stay at, it couldn't get to its, its level of operation. And that might have been a period if you ever watched a race with, uh, with the outriggers, for instance, they're a good example. Because when they fall off the pipe, they call it, they, or they can't get on pipe, they just sit around going, whoa, you know, for years I'd listen to people behind me at the races going, how come he's not going fast? How come he doesn't give it throttle? Well, that guy had it full blast, okay? But he couldn't get that prop up in the air to start spinning, couldn't get the horsepower to get it spinning fast enough to get it up on plane. And if you notice, you can wiggle them around, you can take them around a turn and, and try to loosen that prop up. If you were able to get the prop up on top, that boat would look at it, come right up and go. That is a good example of what a zero band pipe's capabilities cannot do. Okay? However, on the top end, the transition from low to high is almost instant, like a light switch. And that, that's what a zero band pipe is. When I ran into this situation where, with the large monos or the large Vs when the consumer wanted to buy a boat that he wanted to play around with and go real slow and then be able to go fast, I started finding this was a problem. So with the large boats, we developed what we called the band pipe. And that was, again, derivative of the 15cc pipes where we would, add, we would add sections between the convergence and divergence cone. And by doing this, we broadened the mid-range capabilities of the engine. So now the engine could gradually go from slow up to high, and then back to slow, and then back from slow to high, and we had a nice progressive mid-range and top end. We did lose, we found we lo lost a little bit on top end, but like anything else, there's a little bit of a trade-off. But the advantages were now we had a pipe that we had a we had a boat that was capable of having a clutch, stop, idle, get up on step, go, and and do this time after time again, and we find the band pipes. Our, the applications work best for engines that, and boats that require high horsepower. Uh, the large eight scale hydros, the band pipe is almost have to have it, especially if you're using an engine with a clutch. Uh, a, a catamaran, another good place. A place where you need a broad range to be able to throttle up, get up to on pipe, and then throttle back down and do this over and over again. Whereas the zero band pipe can get you in a situation where it's more like a light switch. It's off or it's on. And if you can't get that engine up into a horsepower range or the RPM range where it can make its horsepower and go on, it, it can help hold it back. So you basically want to determine whether or not you're going to buy a, a, a zero band or a band pipe based on the boat and the size of the boat. So if you're going to tell me, hey, I'm going to build a race boat, I want to go as fast as I can, I'm going to build a light boat, it's going to be under 48 inches long, you know, generally we're going to know you're going to be in the 67 to 70 millimeter prop range on surface, and I tell you, go with the zero band pipe. That'll give you that off and on. And then if you told me if we're going to buy, build a big cat, 50, 50, you know, 48, 50, 55 inch cat, where you're going to run a larger prop and you want something that might have a clutch on it, then definitely the band pipe would be the one to, to buy. Again, racing boats, smaller, even DBs and cats, you can get away with a zero band. Larger boats, I recommend the two inch band. And the reason we say two inch guys, you've heard this many times, not the diameter. The diameter pipe, I believe it's been a long time, I think these diameters were like two and a quarter that we, we, we ran in on. 
uh, found, yeah, about two and a quarter. But the band pipe is determined by the distance of the band itself. And in this case, it's a two inch band. Okay, we're getting towards the end. Let's touch on a couple things about using the tune pipe that are important. And again, let's go back to the dry pipe because they're the ones that create most of the heat. So there's a couple concerns we have, okay? Water is really important that you have the header, manifold, and the pipe coupler section water cool properly. So you need a good water flow, okay? So make sure that when the boat's going past you, there's a good three or four inch stream coming out of this, this particular fitting. Or when it's sitting there idling on shore with a clutch, there's a little bit, a, a small stream coming out. It's very important. Okay, we talked about tuning, and that's obviously bringing the pipe in and out. Let me tell you a couple other things about tuning. Very important. Stop collars right here. This pipe stop collar. Now I've got the part of it off that holds it together, but what they do is it's a dual purpose design product. It's a simple collar that squeezes against the header itself. It also prevents the pipe from going forward this way when it's tightened up. It also has a little collar that locks here which prevents the pipe from going backwards because when a pipe is right and it's set, there's actions taking place. And if you don't have a pipe stop collar or some way to hold that pipe secure, the actual suction alone can actually shorten your pipe when you're running. And that would change the tuning. And if that happened, you know, then you wouldn't have a tuned pipe anymore. So that's really important. And that's a needed product. And that's called the pipe stop. Right there. Okay, let's talk about heat before we go. Another important thing. Remember I told you about temperatures. The temperature of this spot right here and from this point back get relatively high. You can easily see temperatures over 300 degrees here. Okay? And higher on the header. Which means that we have to be smart where we're putting them in the boat. Okay? We have to have proper air space. And I tell guys all the time, at least a half inch from any type of wood or fiberglass around the pipe. Half inch air space. Half inch from the radio box. Okay? And if you're going to put this pipe inside of a boat, a dry pipe with a header permittable to put inside a boat, make sure you leave yourself more. And let, make sure you have air coming in that hole, that hole somehow to get across this pipe. You don't want that pipe cooking inside there and cooking your radio box, gas tank, stringers and everything else because they do get hot. Okay, that's very important. So let's not forget airspace and properly placing it in the right area. We make, we make all kinds of headers, different configurations. This is an inch and a half 90. This means that it's an inch and a half before the 90. Okay, we make two and a half, three and a half and all types. You can see them on the website and this is so you can move them around if you need to put the pipe more to the left, you get more of a, of, a, of a header. If you need less, you use what we have here. Okay? That's also very important to know. Okay, here's a frequent question and sometimes problems that I hear uh, quite commonly. And that's where someone will build a boat and they'll basically set everything up based on the length of the tune pipe. And that's absolutely not the way to do it. And the length of the tune pipe is vital to performance. We know this, okay? But more so vital is the proper achieving the right center of gravity of the boat and the placement of the engine. So you want to really work with the engine placement as a priority. And if you run into this situation to where the pipe is too short to exit the transom, let me show you a couple tricks that will get you out of that, okay? The stringer is critical in the design of a pipe. And that's the end here and the final exhaust opening. So if you were to extend this stringer with the same diameter, for instance, this particular pipe is a half of an inch, and you started making an extension, that would cause a problem in the tuning of the pipe and, and it would hamper the performance of the engine. However, I've done a lot of testing with adding oversized stingers. And here's some common material, aluminum, that is available at uh, stores like Home Depot or good quality uh, garden, uh, you know, uh, hardware stores. And there's a couple different sizes. You, you have a 5 8 inch ID, very thin wall, and also 3 quarter inch ID, also very thin wall. The wall thickness is about 60 thousandths of an inch. And these particular pieces of aluminum can be added to a, the end of a stinger or the end of the pipe, like this, and you can see that it's, the diameter is much larger than the stinger. It will allow the, the gases to expand and get out of there quickly. And I've used pieces like this for years and have used them in, in lengths of 8, 10 inches and it have not really hampered the performance of the pipe. Now, I do recommend that if you're going to go over distances over more than six inches that you go to the larger ID, the three-quarter inch pipe. 
And you can see here where the 5H works well, too. If you have short, you need a short little piece to get out of the boat, the 5H works well. Okay, there's a couple of different ways to hook them to the back of the pipe. Now, if you're a TIG welder, you can weld it, obviously, but most people aren't. So the easy way is take a high temperature piece of coupling material, stick it on the pipe first, takes three or four inches, stick this on under the coupling, and then use tie straps to secure two on the pipe, two on this, and that'll hold fine, too. So when you're trying to make an extension that's going to come out the back of your boat and you might be a little short with your pipe, this method works very well. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about before we leave you is the header. When we manufacture headers, we manufacture them on the long side. Again, I don't know what application you're using, what pipe you're using, so I allow for a little extra material. And with that said, you just and I give you the measurement, for instance, you can't just stick the header in the pipe and say, oh, well, my measurements are fantastic, I'm all done. Because now we have six inches of header in the pipe, which is affecting the wave coming back. So, once you have the basis to where to start with measurement on the pipe, and I'll always tell you the long side. So in other words, if you call me, I'll say, okay, start the pipe at 14 and a half inches. That would be generally on the long side. At that point, you want to make your measurement and you want to leave, and this is very important, guys, very important. You want to leave no more, no more than a half inch of this header beyond the second O-ring of the pipe. And the O-ring in the coupler is approximately right about here. Okay? So I would measure a half inch, and that's about as far as I want my header to extend into the pipe. Okay? This gives me the opportunity to shorten it or even lengthen it a quarter inch if I had to. Again, remember, I'll, t I'll always start you guys a little bit on the long side. I'll start you on the power end of it, and then you shorten from there. And then once you find the sweet spot that works best for your boat, then again, you go back and you cut that header to no more than a half inch, because that makes a big difference. And I proved that a couple weeks ago. We were out testing the new Silex boat. I'm proud of the name. Richard Gatt from Malta came up with the name Silex for the new race boat you'll see coming out. Excellent name. Great job, Richard. When I was testing it, we, you know, we, we abide by our own rules. Well, we got the boat running really, really good. We were almost at 62 miles an hour with it. We were, this was not set up for racing, but, but we were trying to get top speed out of it. And Greg and I had, had about a half inch back, and, and I said, hey, we got it. We're, we're right where we want to be. So we then cut them back and cut about a quarter inch off, picked up almost a mile an hour on a quarter of an inch. That one blew me away. And, and I had just taken that half inch back to a quarter because we knew we were, where we were at in the pipe. We were happy with it. And we picked up almost a mile an hour. We were running 61.8 with that boat. And, and we were just, it was just awesome. Okay? So there makes, there's a big difference if you've got a header hanging out in your pipe. That's affecting your performance. Okay, I touched a little bit on the tune pipes, enough to get you guys in trouble, I guess. And again, like I said, there's a lot of information on the Internet. You can go back and find the history of the tune pipes dating back into the 50s, uh, where they started with megaphones, which is a whole other thing. And uh, read up on it. There's a lot of theory about it. Some of it's complicated, a lot of formulas. But we pretty much figured all that out for, mo for gas model boating, and we've got a good array of products available today from Warehouse Hobbies. And uh, you can find pipes elsewhere, I'm sure. And to see everything that we make on Tune Pipes, go to our website at www.whobbies.com, and you can go into Tune Pipes and see the whole array of pipes we make. I appreciate you joining me today. My name is Tony Casanova, hosting Full Throttle RC by Warehouse Hobbies. We'll see you next time.